Well, brothers and sisters, this doesn't happen very often, but once in a while it does. And that is that this morning's uh, sermon, which I have all prepared for us here, is uh, being thrown away. And (laughs) that is because this morning I feel very much like God is calling us to talk about something else. And so uh, Pete will not be looking at the passage that I suggested earlier. Instead, we are looking at Luke chapter 7, verse 36, and following to the end of chapter 7, uh, verse 50. So, But in the meantime, while you uh, figure that out, Pete, thank you for your kindness and uh, flexibility. Um, uh, children, I have a question for you. All right, you ready, children? Yeah? I don't know, I'm not seeing a lot of nodding from many of our children. You ready for a question? All right, it's an easy question. It's an easy question, which I think you'll be able to answer without any problems. Do you ever argue with your siblings, your brothers or your sisters, or your parents? Any, any, any sib- yes? Did you? Yes, thank you, my lovely wife. My lovely wife argues with both her children and her husband, and she used to argue with her siblings, and she still occasionally argues with her parents. And that is not a judgment on her, because I do the same thing. And children, how about you? Yeah, 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 yeah. You argue with them sometimes. Yeah, I see that hand. I hear that. Amen, sister. Yeah. Now, here is another question that is hopefully also easy to answer. Do you love your brothers and sisters and parents? Yes, good. I'm glad to hear that. Yes, David? That's a yes. Okay, good. I thought maybe you were going to say, actually, I don't really. And I was going to say, well, we can talk about that later, David. Yeah, you guys love each other? Yeah? Sometimes. (laughs) I appreciate your honesty, Izzy. Right? This is really cool. This is really cool. We can disagree with, sometimes vehemently or very strongly disagree with our brothers and sisters, and yet still love them. That's good, right? Yeah. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Because that is something that adults, uh, like me, sometimes have struggles with. So, if you want, turn with me to Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50, and, uh, and uh, follow along there in your pew Bibles, or follow along on the screen if Pete was able to do that. If not, that's okay. Good, thanks Pete. I knew you would be able to do it. Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. Now, you're going to have to pay attention very carefully in here because this is a really important story. I mean, all of the stories in the Bible are really important, but for us today, this one really stands out. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, that may sound a little bit weird, uh, children and everybody else, reclining at the table is a little bit odd for us. We normally sit around the table. Of course, that is not necessarily the way that all people at all times have had meals. For example, there are numerous cultures in which people sit on the floor and eat at a low table. Well, in Roman culture, which uh, Jesus was sort of kind of part of, being part of the Roman Empire, uh, they would sort of lay on couches and eat from the table that way. So that's what that means when Jesus reclined at the table with the people there. So, uh, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. 
Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, and notice, notice that the Pharisee said this to himself. He didn't say this, he might not have even said it out loud, and if he did say it out loud at all, he was kind of muttering under his breath. It was not a public comment. But nonetheless, Jesus answers him. Jesus either picks up on it, or Jesus, through the inspiration of the Spirit, knows what he is saying. Regardless, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose, the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears, and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but she, this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, of course, every writer of the gospel messages, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all they all write their 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 gospels with intentionality. They they are intentional about how they structure the gospels. Not that the not that the structure is fake or false or or untrue or anything and they're artificially constructing something, but but they purposefully, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, chose what sequence to put things in. Sometimes the sequence is strictly and totally chronological. Sometimes chronology isn't all that important, necessarily. Because they weren't trying to write history books. They were writing truth, capital T, and so on and so forth. But they intentionally chose which parts to put next to which things. Right? And so it's interesting that immediately after this story, we get the story in chapter 8 of the parable of the sower. And I love the parable of the sower. I'm just going to read a couple of moments from that. We're going to start at verse 5 there. And he says this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on the rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. I love that parable. I love that parable not because I'm a farmer, obviously I'm not. But I love that parable because that farmer is like the worst farmer in the universe. Because he just goes out and throws seeds willy-nilly all over the place. Oh, cement sidewalk? Oh, well, whatever. Here you go. Oh, weed? Whatever. Who cares? Right? He just chucks them everywhere. 
right? And that's what Jesus is like in the story that we just read. Who is Jesus hanging out with? Right? Whose house is he at? The Pharisees' house. And the Pharisees and Jesus had a lot of theology, actually, that was pretty similar to each other. But the things that they disagreed on were big deals. Jesus and the Pharisees did not agree with each other on some pretty important things. And then who else is he hanging out with? The sinner, the sinful woman, right? Jesus also does not agree with the lifestyle that that sinful woman has been leading prior to this time. But what is he doing? He's hanging out with them. He's reclining at table with them. He's being merciful to them and gracious to them. He is arguing even on some levels with some of them. And this is important for us. Because this is the example that Christ has set us. That as His followers, as Christians, we need, we must on some level, be able to love and hang out with and eat with and be merciful to and truthful to the people with whom we disagree. And there are forces at work in this world really really strongly right now that are trying to tear us away from that absolutely essential Christ-like character trait. On two sides. On one side, there are those in this world that are trying to tell us that if you don't agree with me, then I cannot be with you. That I will kick the dust off my shoes and leave this place and that is good and right and proper. If you don't like it, it's my way or the highway. And we are seeing that all over the place. We are seeing that Honestly, in some of the politics that we are seeing in, in, in some right-wing stuff, but also in some left-wing stuff, we are seeing people who are saying, basically, it has to be this way. And if I don't agree with you, then I will put up a flag that says, Trudeau. Right? Those flags that you can see just driving out of town, those are profoundly non un, anti-Christian flags. Because what does Jesus say about our enemies? If you don't like Trudeau's politics, okay, sure, fine. That's okay. But what does Jesus say about our enemies? Oh, I'm asking. Yeah. Love them. Pray for them. So, okay, let's say Trudeau is your political enemy. All right. Love him. Pray for him. Don't put up a flag that says, swear word you, Tr Trudeau. That's contrary to the Christian message. In, in a similar manner, except sort of kind of on the other side, there are those who seem to feel like if you don't agree with me, you can't possibly love me. That if you love me, you must agree with me. And that's just not the way it is. I don't agree with all of the choices that my children make. I don't even agree with all of the choices that I make. And yet, hopefully, I love myself. I'm supposed to, right? And certainly, I love my children. 
If my children... Oh, ooh, oh, okay. It has been sometimes in the past that, that, that when people make choices from our community, let's say, when people make choices from our community that do not line up with what we believe Christian morality to be, when that happens, instead of, instead of treating them as if they were non-Christians and therefore loving them all the more and being all the more hospitable with them, we decided somewhere along the way that, that treating them as if they were non-Christians meant shunning them and kicking them out of our society. How does that make any sense? That's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't say, oh, you got pregnant out of wedlock? Out of here. Get lost. We don't want to talk to you anymore. Not at all. Right? And, and, and likewise, if our children, our grandchildren, the people who, whom we, we know and love, if they say, if they come out to us and they say, I'm gay. I'm transgender. I'm, I don't know, you fill in the blank. Even if we totally, completely disagree with this choice that they are making or this, this lifestyle that they are starting to live, and, 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 and of course, when we're talking about being gay or transgender, it's not necessarily about choice except for the, the response, the way that they live in response to that reality. But we don't say to them, you're no daughter of mine, you're no son of mine, you don't belong in this family anymore, you're dead to me. That is wrong. Biblically, theologically, Christologically wrong. We don't have to agree with their choices. You don't have to say, well, what's right for you is right for you, and that's okay. That's not the way it has to be. But it does have to be that we love them no matter what. And that's going to be hard because there may come a time when our child, our grandchild, our cousin, our niece, our nephew, whatever, comes to us and says, not only am I gay or transgender or whatever, uh, I am, I'm going to get married to my boyfriend or girlfriend. And they're going to want sometimes for us to agree with them, and they may have struggles understanding that we can love them without agreeing necessarily with some of their life choices. And it's going to be tough on a whole bunch of different levels because it's, good, it, it's always tough to communicate that you love someone even if you disagree with them, but it gets tougher when they're so much closer to us because we'll have a tendency to want to dig at that and say, hey, by the way, every opportunity we get, I disagree with you. Hey, I disagree with you. Hey, your lifestyle's bad. Hey, they'll know where you stand. And they will be humbled and honored that you love them unconditionally even though you disagree on this matter. And, and, and the world is trying to force us into the place where either you must agree with us or you must be separate from us. You're either an anti-vaxxer or you're not. You're either a Republican or a conservative or you're not. You're either a liberal or you're not. Right? Mm. We are Christ followers. 
That's what we are. Which means that we love. Not because we're so awesome. Not because we have it all right. Not because we've kicked out all the riffraff who disagree with us. But because that's what Jesus did for us. And that's what he tells us to do for others. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Because it's getting increasingly hard to do that. It's getting so difficult. Remember, first of all, the love and patience of Christ. Notice notice when Jesus talks with Simon the Pharisee, He doesn't just rip into him and totally, you know, tear his skin off with the scathingness of his responses or whatever. He tells him a story. He is patient with him. He is kind with him. It's still true. It's still it's still not pulling punches, but he doesn't like lay into them with like thunder and lightning and brimstone and hellfire. Right? And and notice also that 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 he is merciful and kind and gracious and, and so loving to the woman, the sinner who is, who is expressing her gratitude for forgiveness. But he doesn't say, you know what? All of that previous sin, it wasn't really sin. It was okay. It's fine. Right? We need to maintain that too. Be gentle and gracious and truthful. Gentle and gracious and truthful. And then we need to also remember that the people we are talking to are people. They are God's image bearers. And the people, just because we don't know them personally, doesn't mean they stop being people. Trudeau is a person. Trump is a person. Right? If I go waving around signs that say, swear word Trump, That's not okay either. He's a person. Right? It'd be like you guys putting a sign up on your lawn here in town that says, F Pastor Dan. Well, that's probably going to hurt my feelings. And I'm going to struggle with that. And it's not very loving. Remember that everyone you talk to and everyone who's far away and everybody who's on the news and everybody who's in the media and everybody who's on talk radio and everybody who is on uh, blogs or, or, or podcasts or whatever, they're all people. They are all God's image bearers. They are all beautiful sons and daughters of God. They are those maybe who are not yet Christ followers, but nonetheless they are They are His creation. His loved ones. His images of God. Remember that. Gracious. Kind. Truthful. Remember that every person is a person. An image bearer of God. And try. Try to see. uh, To listen. Try to listen. We're so bad at that. It, it, when, I, when I do pre-marriage classes, this is one of the key things that I teach our young people or, or, or our older folk if they are coming to, to pre-marriage classes. And that is how to listen. How to listen. Right? One of our temptations when somebody starts talking is to listen until they say something with which we disagree, in which case we stop listening, we start formulating our response, and then we jump on them the soonest we opportunity we get. Oh, he said Friday, it was really Thursday. I'm gonna just ooh. right. Listening stopped about five minutes ago. No, uh no good. Listen, here's a trick. <laughs> this is fun. Practice reflective listening. What is reflective listening? 
for those of you who don't know, that is where you listen the whole way through to make sure you got it. You reflect back to them. You say, so, what I hear you saying is, and then you summarize in your own words what you think the other person said. So what I hear you saying is that you're really angry about the restrictions that have been put upon us since COVID started two years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's really important that not only am I angry about that, but I also feel like it is, it is breaking down the constitutional freedoms that we should have in this country. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I hear now that you're not only angry about it, but that it's also you're concerned about how it's breaking down our constitutional freedoms. Yeah, yeah, you got it, right? You reflect back to them what you heard them say, what you think you heard them say. You give them an opportunity to say yes or to correct or enhance or whatever. And then after that, then you can start responding. Right? Okay, I hear you. I, I, I understand that. And you know what that does? That makes people who, who want you to listen recognize that you did listen. And they feel loved. And they feel respected. And they feel honored. And it also makes them open, more open, to you disagreeing with them. Now, truth be told, often you're going to find out that you have far more similarities and agreement than you thought you did because you actually listened to the person. Right? So, you reflect back to them. You hear what they're actually saying. And then you respond respectfully and lovingly to that. Right? Another trick for communicating well with God's image bearers in this world is to use, to use proper assertiveness. Okay? That is being able to ask for what you want or what you need in a relationship. And by relationship, I'm obviously not talking just about marriage relationship. I'm talking about any relationship. The relationship you have with the, with the customer service representative at Home Depot when you're trying to return something that's just outside of the return window. And, and that's a relationship. Right? You say things, you take responsibility for things. You Home Depot people, you're always messing me around. Okay, well, that's not helpful. And she's just not part of some corporate identity that is nameless and faith. She's a person. I feel like often when I come with returns, I get the runaround. You take ownership over it. You say, I feel like, I, I believe, it seems to me, I, I feel like this, not ye, right? But you ask for what you want. You ask for what you need. I feel like you are making these choices about your lifestyle because you're wanting to rebel against me as your parent. I feel like you're just upset maybe about how I raised you or something. Is that true? Can we talk about that? Not, you always rebel against me. You're such a snotty little teenage kid. <laughs> Not that I've ever said that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Be gracious and kind and truthful. Remember that everyone, whether you know them or not, whether they're near or far, whether they're famous or not, whoever they are, they're all image bearers of God. And really listen to them. And be, be honest and kind and humble, but truthful in your responses. I feel like, I think, it seems to me, it's not you Okay. This is how, at least in part, this is not a magic pill or bullet that fixes everything in this world, but we need to hold on to this. We need to hold on to that Christ-like ability to be 
with the people with whom we disagree and yet be loving and truthful and righteous. And it's being eaten away. So please, brothers and sisters, I am so, so, so grateful that 99% of my interactions with you have been like that. The good, I mean the good parts. <laughs> right? You have listened to me. You have been gracious to me. And you have been truthful to me. You have treated me like a human being, like a Christ follower, like an image bearer. And I feel like far more often than not, God has blessed you and enabled you to do the same with one another and the people in this world. But I also feel like the strain is showing. That the cracks are there. That it's maybe a little bit easier for us to dig in our heels. A little bit harder for us to be gracious than maybe it was before all this began. Don't let go of it. And if you have some opportunity to learn some of it new, do it. Grab hold of it. Learn more. But we must hold on to this Christ-like trait. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so, so very much for the example of your son Jesus. Sometimes, oh God, I confess that Jesus' ability to, to, to love and hang out with people with whom he disagreed so fundamentally, sometimes that seems almost magical to me, oh God. And yet I know that Jesus was fully human. And, and, and that yes, He listened to the Holy Spirit just as we have access to the Holy Spirit, but all of this love, all of this, all of this, this truthfulness and graciousness, all of this righteousness and holiness and mercy, all of it, He lived out in His humanity. And so Lord, please, please help us. Help us to hold on to that in these difficult, difficult times. But also, O oh God, help us to grow more and more into people who can be like Your Son, Jesus. Who can sow the seeds of Your love and Your good news wherever we go willy-nilly and who do so through grace and truth, through love and righteousness, through mercy and holiness. Lord, help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll invite the praise team forward to sing a uh, song of response. Now we were we were going to be preaching about blessings and woes from Luke uh, as well, and, and so this song might appear at first blush to be a little bit unrelated, but it's not because you see this is the thing. All of us in this world, as human beings, in this broken and messed up world, we are all hungering. We are all thirsting. We are all struggling. We are all facing tremendous difficulties. And those who can, those who can reach out in love are blessed. And, and those who are suffering for Jesus' name's sake are blessed. And those those who cannot reach out to their fellow human beings, woe unto them. So, let us stand and sing as our song of response. Blessed are they, number 73 in the supplement or on the screen.
uh, behind me as well.